Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds. We are uh, in the oh, latter, latter half of April now, and a lot of people are, you know, excited about the migration season, what's going on, and uh, the hummingbirds are a big topic. Uh, the, the nice what I thought we would talk about a lot of, and that are the we call this the jelly birds, and that are uh, the birds uh, that frequent your jelly. And, and the longer we've uh, been offering up jelly now for almost 40 years or so, uh, the more birds that we find that will eat uh, and come to jelly to so get that that hit of uh, sweetness and energy to, to help them hunt and all. So Welcome in. Uh, remember, uh, my name is Mark McKellar, and I am uh, here in the heart of the country. We are in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, right out here in the heartland. And hi, Steve. Hi, Jim. Good to welcome you guys in. Uh, Warren, Ohio, and South Alabama. I am producerless tonight, so I'm flying solo. The wife, we had car trouble today, and the wife had to go transfer. Uh, I get a vehicle and she'll might be sliding in here late, but uh, if I'm kind of having to see me looking a lot, I don't have her let me know that, uh, that that you guys are and asking questions. Hi, Colt. Welcome in. Ryan, good to have you. Come, thanks for joining in. We got some uh, YouTubers, and I don't know if anybody's on Facebook yet. They just didn't see me. I was, I, we went through, Melly and I went through a, a, a training the other night on. Uh, StreamYard, which is this program that I use to uh, to broadcast with, and learn quite a bit. And one of the things that uh, that we learned on there is that there's like an eight second delay at sometimes, especially for people that are on Facebook. And so they may not they may be behind. So kind of have to be patient with that when you and, and knowing that uh, they'll might jump on a little bit later or they're there and they, they can't. I can't see notes from things like that. So uh, I also uh, uh, learned about a thing, a thing or two about uh, that uh, entry uh, page that was on instead of just being a black screen. And, you know, there's, there was some pretty cool things and uh, I'm glad to, uh, to learn more about it. So hopefully this will run smoother and smoother. So I uh, Jen. Up in Maine, God, I love it. We honeymooned in Maine. We love that part of the world. Um, but I love, you know, I love going all over this country, and 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 of course, birds are always the center of whenever I go anywhere, and to plan out my bird watching expeditions whenever I'm there. And a lot of times, uh, the kids and the wife would sleep late, and I'm out every morning bird watching. And then when I get back, we go grab. Uh, breakfast and then get going, but uh, uh, Maine is one of my favorite places to go. So, hi Ruth, Lynn County, Kansas, welcome in. Colt said he saw two red-headed woodpeckers today, and I had four bluebird eggs in my box. Excellent, excellent. I, I sure hope your red-headed woodpeckers can nest successfully without the starlings running them off. We were having that conversation with our bird hikes every Thursday morning, and again, I am you know, trying to give people time to get chimed in here, get, 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 uh, again, before we start talking about the night's topic, but kind of update on our bird hike this morning. We do every Thursday morning. We were down near the Missouri River, uh, this morning and, and had some good birds. We, uh, we got over an inch of rain last night. And so there were some flooded, um, soccer fields and, and, uh, a part of a wetland area down there that had finally had some water in it. And, uh, we had a white-faced ibis and a willet and, and some yellow eggs down there. We, you know, we had a, a decent variety of birds. We heard no Orioles, though. Well, once again, well, I think the Orioles are late. Uh, we, I did have a customer just uh, posted on our website, our, our Facebook, that she had her two Orioles tonight, and she was so excited. So maybe the Orioles are going to start to filter in now. The, the hummingbirds are been creeping in, uh, but Orioles, man, have been scarce. And usually we hear them down along the Missouri River before we even see them at bird feeders. And I did not hear a single one down in that area that uh, we'll have a lot of them in, uh, in the coming weeks. And, and so I don't know about where you guys are. I don't know if you've, you've seen many uh, Orioles yet. Uh, but again, that's a bit kind of the topic tonight of the conversation, our Orioles and the other birds who visit uh, jelly feeder. So, um, and again, if I, whenever we're talking about this, you know, here in the heart of the country, you guys to the south, 
ahead of us, you guys in the north, a little bit behind us. Um, and if I there's birds that you see eating your jelly that um, that I don't cover here, definitely chime in. Let me let me know. I I, I, I I'm limited by this program by the number of slides I can have, uh, so I can't put every slide of every bird that I have has seen eating the jelly. But a lot of birds take advantage of it. More and more birds take advantage of it. So, but the whole thing got started, um, really. Okay, Chandler's in the lower Piedmont of Georgia. Excellent. St. John, Washington, that's Washington State. Denise, is that right? We don't have a lot of wet people from the West. You know, that it, um, that is, uh, I'm glad to have somebody that can chime in from the, the Western part of the U.S. When we talk, like, you would have Bullock's Orioles instead of Baltimore Orioles and, and uh, other birds you might be seeing. It may be different than what we get to see in our jelly because I've never lived out West. So, uh, you know, I'm not as experienced with the, the bird feeder birds out there. I've done much, a lot of bird watching out there, but not any bird feeding, really. All right, Cole says, of course, one year I have had rid of dual pickers and I have starling crawls. Yep, I got one good shot at them today, but I missed. <laughs> yeah, remember, those starlings are not protected and you can take them out. Um, the um, the starlings that, that on the hike this morning, that's what brought it up. Um, one of the, pe the people on the hikes this morning said that he has a red bellied nest. And these starlings have been starting to harass that red-bellied and, and hanging around his house, the the, uh, the nest hole. And so the red belly's putting up a fight. But boy, he, he said he's afraid the starlings going to win because they usually do. Anything he can do to help them. Hi, Joshua. I have my jelly out. Excellent. And a little earlier, but just in case of an early bird. Yeah, they can always. Be. You're in southwestern Michigan. Yep, they can show up there. And there you go. The house, the house finches are a mainstay of the jelly. Uh, they love the jelly. Archipelagos, starlings are really bad this year for some reason. Yeah, it does seem that way that in, I don't know in, if it's in certain environmental conditions that favor them or, or uh, they, they tend to put a lot of strain on the native uh, cavity nesting birds. I sure try. It seems like... <laughs> <laughs> they are. I, Cole says they're really smart, and he's right. I mean, starlings, they, man, they are super shy when it comes to hearing a door opening or a window starting to slide up. They they bolt, absolutely. All right. This is 5 p.m. here. I'm usually leaving for a uh, and I can't join in time. This is a, a treat for me. Good. Yeah, I, you know, I, I would do it here 7 Central time. So, yeah, that, that makes sense that, that you guys are there just getting off work. That you can't, I'm glad you're able to join us tonight. Excellent. Well, all right. I think we got the time, a little time here to let people join in with us. So we'll get going. Um, the, uh, the topic of the night are the jelly feeders and, and, and those that come to them. Of course, the whole thing started because of uh, and, and, and Orioles and in our part of the world, Baltimore Orioles. And for those of you who don't know uh, the, that the history of this, the, the Bullock's Oriole, which is the Western counterpart of the Baltimore Oriole, uh, years ago, there were two different species. And then uh, the, the, the population started to overlap because of settlement in the U.S. And uh, so the birds kind of creeping from the West and uh, the bullocks uh, coming down out of the plain uh, into the plains, and Baltimore's go, being able to move a little further west. They started interbreeding, and they lumped them into one species and called them northern Orioles. Well, enough time passed, uh, uh, and enough DNA work was done, and they finally split them back out again. So instead of nor if you have, it depends on what age of field guide you have, you may just see northern Oriole in there. But uh, now it's by, back to Baltimore Oriole and and Bullock's Oriole, so they are uh, two different species, and uh, that's a whole different conversation as to wh what conditions come together for lumping species and splitting species. But Baltimore is in the eastern two thirds of the country, and that's the bird uh, kind of credited with you know, a lot. In, obviously, you know, in our part of the world, as to why people feed jelly. And again, I don't know who the credit with who started the jelly thing. Uh, they will eat citrus and. Uh, they, like I said, mostly oranges, but also grapefruits and lemons and things like that. But uh, they do love grape jelly. And, and it's, the grape jelly for most of us, not everybody, now most of us, tends to be a fairly short-lived uh, 
feeding frenzy, and that is when they first return in the spring, especially if there's not a lot of their favorite flowers blooming and things like that, they, they, and not a lot of insects, and they really hit the jelly hard. Um, and it, it, for at least in my yard, it lasts for about two to three, and in some years up to four weeks uh, uh, that that initial time they get in, but mainly it's about a two-week show for the most part. I don't know how that uh, uh, stacks up where you are, if that is uh, kind of the, the time frame that you see them. But once they go off and they start nesting and they start, you know, really consuming insects and having to feed their babies insects, the jelly becomes far less popular with them. And so a lot of people substitute the, the jelly dish. They'll fill it with mealworms to help the, the Orioles feed their baby. So I had an orchard Oriole around a year ago and some cut up oranges in my yard, but they didn't eat them. Interesting. Yeah, Colt, they, uh, the Orchard Orioles, which are, uh, let me grab that in there, the Orchard Oriole picture there, and he is that burnt red or burnt orange color and black, a little bit smaller than the Baltimore, uh, but they do like the jelly too. They're just, they're, you know, they're not as numerous and it's very really habitat driven, I think, too. And migration, they can show up anywhere, but for nesting, I've always said, you know, they, the orchard orioles tend to like willows, uh, where the, the Baltimore's like bigger, older trees. Uh, but in migration, they can show up anywhere. Uh, but I never have nearly as many orchard orioles at my feeders as I do Baltimore's. You know, some years I can have a dozen Baltimore orioles visiting. Uh, and most of the time I have two to three to four, you know, at, at whenever they're they're coming through and they're, they're they're hanging around for a few days and boy Melanie loves them they're one of her favorite birds and when they're coming to the feeders you know she just loves it and and that's great I, you know they they really uh, are a catch bird I call it you know that click bird whenever you first start bird watching what bird turns you on what what got you to start wow that's beautiful and it made you really start looking at birds well Baltimore Orioles serve that purpose and and, that, and for a lot of people that the or the Baltimore Orioles get, a, get people really excited about bird feeding and you know it, I say it you know we used to sell mostly hummingbird feeders in the spring but now the Oriole feeders are just as popular and and, they, and people love them and they uh, they love attracting them to their yard yeah, the first thing I noticed is that they were much smaller than, yeah, Colt, that's right. Yeah, they are, they're daintier. They're not as, there's not as hefty uh, and that, not quite as long, but they're, uh, they're pretty birds. And when we talk about birds and, and, and that come to feeders like this, and we always talk about sexual dimorphism, and that is, you can tell the males from the females uh, by their colors and the orchard orioles are, uh, we even have to take that a, a step further. And we talked about this once before and that, uh, a female orchard oriole is yellow like this, but this isn't a female. Uh, this is a first year male orchard oriole. Uh, and this uh, black face uh, on them and black chin is what distinguishes them. You see the bill is the same as that adult male. Uh, the body shape, everything about that is an oriole. Uh, it's just that color very difference. And so next year, if this bird survives this entire season, uh, migration, when he gets back, Next spring, he'll be, you know, an adult and adult plumage. So he will look like this. Uh, but his first year of life, he tends to they look like this. And they, uh, it can be very confusing when you see that bird show up among your Orioles. And, and but he, he'll he'll be singing just like an adult male. And, uh, and, and when you see him in the wild and you hear him calling, you look at me, see that bird, it is somewhat confusing. But that is a, a first year male orchard Oriole. And they do come to the oranges. They do come to the jelly. Uh, and what when I talk about feeding or Orioles, I always say, let the Orioles tell you what they want to eat. Um, yep, it, Michael, he, he says he had, uh, had them on their hummingbird feeders. That's how the whole thing started. Those Baltimore Orioles would land on hummingbird feeders and, and drink the sugar water out of there. I remember watch, uh, watching one one time, bird watching at, at People's Yard. It was at, at the park. And it, it's a, there was a, a house right on the water had a hummingbird feeder with the old yellow bee baskets in it. And I watched this Oriole land on it, take his beak and pop the bee, that yellow bee basket out into the, went out into the grass and he, so he could get his uh, face in there to drink better from that hummingbird feeder. So that's how, you know, when they, they, that started happening is when people started configuring feeders and figuring out other things that, that could attract those Baltimore Orioles. Uh, and yeah, and, and some people only feed the nectar. This this feeder here, it's got an Oriole fest, and you can see it's got sugar water in it. 
and they, they have big, a little bit bigger holes so the Orioles can get their bills down there and drink better than from a little, the little hummingbird feeder. So uh, this feeder can also hold grape jelly. We'll see it in other photos uh, coming up because it's a, a, our best-selling Oriole feeder of all time. And, and people use it because you can feed jelly out of it, you can feed sugar water out of it, and you can also put an orange half or orange quarter on that stem if you wanted to. So all three things that they like. So... The, uh, it, so the Orioles are, are, are what got the whole thing going, Baltimore and Orchard and our area out west. You get, like I said, you guys uh, they have the Bullocks and down in the southwest. I don't know if the, uh, like, Scots Orioles come to the Oriole feeders down in that area. Uh, you know, there, there are other species of Orioles, but those are the main ones that occur through the biggest part of the U.S. and, and points north. So. Yes, cold. Yeah, cold is asking: Are Orioles related to grackles and, or blackbirds? Absolutely, they are members of the blackbird family. So, uh, Ecteridae is the name of the family, and that includes red-winged blackbirds. That includes uh, meadowlarks. That includes grackle. So, yeah, they, now starlings are not in that group. Cold, completely different family. But the uh, the blackbirds, most blackbirds, uh, they are just really pretty blackbirds, as we say. Yeah. And you can kind of see, especially red-winged blackbirds, you can see the bill shape is very similar. Uh, and, of course, the red-wings ha have that more colorful uh, epilepsy, as they call it, uh, on them. So, yes, they are members of the blackbird family. Now, in my yard, probably the most next most common bird that visits my jelly are the summer tanagers. Now they, uh, I, I, I'm very wooded at, at the back of my yard, and uh, they the tanagers are woodland birds, and so habitat-wise, they are uh, to be expected. I hear them singing all the time. Uh, you'll hear people call them uh, red birds, and they say, "You say cardinal?" They go, "No, no, I'm talking about the red bird." And and this is a lot of times what they're talking about: the summer tanager, um, and these birds are related to cardinals. Uh, there are a lot of tanagers in the world. They're, most of them occur in the tropics. And we've learned through DNA work and genetic work in the last uh, 15 years that our tanagers, these guys, are not as closely related to those in the tropics as we once thought. So they have actually split and moved our tanagers, the summer tanager, scarlet tanager, western tanager, and hepatic tanager. They have all, they've been moved. And now the summer tanager and, and uh, uh, the phylogenetic order of things and birds, but they are beautiful birds, very popular. They eat lots of insects uh, and they, they will eat fruit as well. And when they come in, especially weather conditions, they, they will gobble up the jelly. And I see them at my feeders in the spring. Uh, and then we talk about the you know, sexual dimorphism. Hey, day 44, where are you, where are you checking in from? Uh, the, uh, this is a male summer tanager. And this is a female summer tanager, so very different in the in their uh, the coloration. Completely yellow, uh, completely red, uh, but their bill is the same. They have a pretty good sized bill there, uh, and they but she'll come in and, and eat all the jelly as well. Hi, Jan, Central Alabama. I noticed birds at my hunger feeder. Yep. Bet they are Orioles. Learn something, learn something all over time. Excellent. Thank you. I'm glad to know that. Yeah. You've not had a tan. It, yeah, yeah. The tanagers. Can, I can say at my at my hummingbird at my Oriole feeders at my old house. I was in a much more open uh, area. Lived out there for ten years. I never saw a tanager out there because there weren't just there weren't enough trees. It's very open. We moved into this neighborhood, uh, and the name of our neighborhood is called Thousand Oaks. So there's a lot of trees in our in this neighborhood. And summer, I hear summer tanagers singing all summer. They nest in the woods behind my house, so that makes sense. Why well, you know we have them here. It just depends on how everything's habitat driven uh, when it comes to birds. You know they're going to fill the niche where uh, they they get what they need, and, and their habitat requirements are different. So now one of the fun things about you know we showed you I showed you the uh, the first year orchard oriole, how that confuses people. Wow, now here's a bird that really confuses people, uh, is a first year male summer tanager. Uh, not, if it depends on when they, they hatched last year, but a lot of times when they get back here uh, in the spring of their first year, they'll be, a, we call them mustard and ketchup birds. And they'll be half red or part red and part yellow. Uh, Cause when he, when this uh, bird hatched, 
And his first many months of life, he was yellow like the female. He looked very much like that female. So it's not as easy to call a young male from a female in the fall after ha they've, everything's hatched. But early in the spring, like now when they're coming in, when you see one of these 50-50 birds, it's and they can be all kind of blotches, red and yellow. This is this kind of looks like a pattern, but they, you know, there'll be a patch red here and you know, a patch red under here and a yellow over here. Uh, and they, they, they really do look kind of messed up and it, it confuses people mightily. You know, I've answered identification calls on this bird and people send me pictures a lot in the spring when they see them on their oil feeders. But this is a first year male uh, summer tanager. And uh, so, you know, he compared to this guy and this girl, he is somewhere in between. So the, the mustard and ketchup bird, we call him, the summer tanager. Now, in my, in my opinion, Peoria, Illinois, welcome in. Yep. It does. And that is, a, it, it, Cole said, look, almost looks like a male house finch. And that is some, it's a bird that will get guests sometimes. And they'll, they'll think they have a house finch. It's got a lot of yellow in it. Um, but no, yeah, this is, and he's larger than a house finch and the bill is a bit different, but yeah, the coloration will make you jump there. A bird that I've never had at my jelly, but other people have, um, is the scarlet tanager, uh, which in, in my opinion is one of those beautiful birds in North America. This, uh, and, and it's very hard for cameras to capture how brilliant the red is in them. Uh, they don't. They are not a cardinal red. They are a glowing red. They are beautiful in that black wings and black tail, high contrast. And and more, I think that they're they tend to be, in my opinion, shyer than the summer tanagers. So I think they, you know, they're not as ready to come ready to come into bird feeders and stations and things. But people see them occasionally. I've had people have them eating suet uh, in the spring when they come through. Uh, they're they can be hungry and they'll, they'll nibble on that. And like I said, it depends on the food availability when they arrive in, in certain areas. So I always want to look out and see a, a, a scarlet tanager on my feeders, but I've had them in my woods, but I've not had them. I've never seen them on my feeders themselves, but you may have. Beautiful, beautiful bird. Yeah, Joshua, you're right. Grape jelly is the most popular for sure. Um, I, I How other jams and drinks? I have had over the years i've had so many people that have tried everything and every, i mean logically most people think orange marmalade would be the one that you know could, because they do love citrus but i most of i've had people say they eat it but they just don't like it as well obviously as the grape jelly and we're not talking about jams in reserve we really are just talking about cheap grape jelly uh, we do prefer it to have natural sugar uh, rather than high fructose corn syrup in it but uh, yeah, I've had people try strawberry, all, right, all these different kinds, and, and 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 most everybody tends to agree that uh, the grape jelly is what they like the most. So the the flavor that we sell is called birdberry jelly, and it's a grape blackberry combination uh, that we sell. It has no fruit, high fructose corn syrup in it, and they sure eat that mite art. I can tell you, they they like it. So. Uh, Hi, Jen. Let's see. I've never seen a tanager that I'm aware of. Do you travel up as far north? Yeah, the, you should have tanagers up your way up in Maine, uh, especially scarlets. Um, uh, but they, yeah, I, I, you know, you'll look out there one day and you'll see this red bird and you'll go, whoa, what's that? Uh, that they are, uh, they're stunning. No, uh, ivory bill woodpeckers, I, uh, Cole's asking, you no, know, they, I'm convinced those birds have been extinct now uh, for, you know, 80 years. I, they, you know, the sightings that uh, reportedly came in and they search crews. I know a guy personally who was down there filming and, and uh, on one of the search teams for one of them in Arkansas. And uh, I, as much as I'd love to believe that there's still some alive. No, I, I, they, unfortunately I was not born whenever the last ones were officially documented and the singer track down there. So that's a dream bird. The other bird that's a dream bird to me is the uh, Carolina parakeet. That's the word that I would, you know, it's extinct that I would have loved to have seen. They were all over where I grew up, uh, you know, before they were all drove to extinction. So, yeah, you know, I rebuilt, they're, they're, 
the the big the biggest confusion for a lot of people with the ivory build is that there are there are a lot of pileated out there that and there are a lot of pileated with aberrant with a lot of white on them or even less white on them that will throw you off and seeing that bill and you know the ivory bill is one of the noisiest birds uh, that has ever lived and that was the thing that really worried a lot of the experts about this bird that supposedly was in Arkansas. They put recording devices all over that swamp and they never heard a peep out of them. Uh, and this is a bird that by all historical documentation, this bird was so noisy, it never shut up. And it just would, and for them not to be able to get any peep of a, a recording of it down there and months and months of listening, it, it, it just uh, led to a lot of doubters. Dave from Rhode Island, hello there. You to follow your don't forget to like the video. Th oh, Dave, thank you so much. Yep, the uh, uh, it makes a difference. Like I said, said that that it, it does definitely help whenever you guys chime in and the, the algorithms and uh, and the, with with YouTube, the likes really do help. Um, and the comments help. You know, they they really they, they like to see interaction between you know viewers and and the, the host. So. All right. Thank you so much for reminding me. That's, that's great. All right. From the scarlet tanner drew to a bird that does visit jelly uh, quite a bit. It's, and it just depends on if you have kind of thicker underbrush, you know, uh, in your, near your feeders and all. It's the gray catbird. Um, this is, this, you know, catbirds are, you know, mimic thrushes like the mockingbird and the brown thrasher. Uh, they are, they are quite good mimics. They they can mimic other birds' calls. That's a great picture of this bird with the with the jelly in his beak, and you can see that uh, uh, they uh, they're beautiful birds, and they do like thicker underbrush. And one of the reasons I don't have them here in my yard is unfortunately my previous the previous owner of this house and all my neighbors clear out all of the underbrush uh, from uh, you know their yards way back, and and I <laughs> I'm the black sheep in the neighborhood. I like my underbrush uh, in the back part of my yard and I let it, but it's not enough to really attract the catbirds in there because they, they, they like to have that underbrush, but a great bird. It does love grape jelly and uh, you'll see them uh, interacting, you know, kind of fighting the Orioles sometimes over it. Uh, the black cap, that, that great slate gray body and the Rufus under his tail, which is pretty neat. Uh, but they are, they are, and they do make that sound so that's where you know the, the, the name comes from um let's see the cat bird that i get likes to eat on the poke but with pokeweed yeah and that, that pokeweed is a source of that fruit that natural fruit that they like and that's the, what that jelly is providing for them as they do they do eat a lot of berries than that the mimic thrush family and i i, I know that mockingbirds can also visit a jelly. I've never had them. Well, you know, you got to remember up here in Kansas City, we're on the north end of the range for mockingbirds. Uh, mockingbirds are very much a southern bird. Uh, and so you guys down south, I don't, if you guys have mockingbirds that visit jelly, I'd love to know that. But but we just don't have a lot of them in the Kansas City region. They're here, but not a lot. Uh, and I've never had a customer say, hey, I got a, 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 a visiting mockingbird they do eat their mockingbirds mainly eat raisins that people put out soaked in water uh they'll eat all those especially in the winter months so chandler says i've got a small succession area on my yard that the heavy that are in native weeds like sorrel and pokeweed absolutely and Denise says, I would love to see a northern cardinal, but no, nah, they don't visit west of the right. Yeah, you don't, not not up north, you know. They, I, I, the story I tell Denise about that is uh, when I was at, uh, at my nature center here in Kansas City, and this lady is in the back, the bird viewing area. I heard her, she kind of let out the screams. And I ran back there to see what was going on. And she said, what is that beautiful red bird? <laughs> it was a cardinal. And she said, she was from northern Idaho. And she had never seen a cardinal before. And, you know, they're so common for all of us out here. We just, you know, to, for somebody not to be familiar, we, they're not seeing cardinals. It, it's pretty amazing. So, yeah, I understand that. Uh, they, they are America's favorite songbird. And uh, they, they, if you guys don't get to see them, that is that is a loss for sure. But you guys get uh, the, the black-headed grow speaks out there, which are, are related to them and, and some other beautiful species for sure. All right. Ryan says... 
Okay, you're mockingbirds eat jelly. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, I would think they would. I mean, they're fruit loving birds. I grew up one that lived in my mo my mother's pyracantha bush out front, and it was just always loaded with orange berries. And that mockingbird ate those pyracantha berries all the time. Hi, Josh. My, hi, Mark. My seven year old Sam is watching with me. He wanted to me to ask you if the Orioles can get sick if the oranges or jelly is go bad. Um, it's, it's much harder for them to get sick, but it is possible. It is definitely where you really want to uh, change it out regularly and uh, make sure you, the oranges are fresh and the, and the jelly is fresh as well. So, uh, you know, sugar can ferment, sugar can turn bad. So, yeah, it is good. It's a good idea to keep those, the jelly and the fruit uh, fresh for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Cold. Yeah. They, 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 for people in the, the South, especially in the Southeastern part, in the, the Central. Uh, cardinals are very common. I've heard the catbird. I really does sound like cat. Yeah, it, it does. It, uh, it's funny. They that, they alert me to their presence a lot of times because they're they're good mimics. So sometimes you can get fooled as to what what maybe you might be think it might be a wren or something, and then it keeps calls changing its call, and then every once in a while he'll do that. Rawr, and say, oh, it's catbird in the bushes. Yep. Yeah. Steve says, interesting about mockingbirds and jelly. You may have to put some out to see what, yeah, happens. I only concern the southern heat and the mockingbirds. Yeah, you're right. I mean, mockingbirds can really dominate a bird feeder station, you know, whenever they, they come. So you might want to put it a little further away from maybe the other feeders. But, I, you know, the, I know down south, guys, Steve, you guys don't get Orioles other than in migration. And they probably, you know, they'll push through there pretty quick. So, uh, the the jelly might not be as a, a big a hit, but I bet the I bet you could get mockingbirds and catbirds too down there. I would assume. What time does oral is that Orioles usually come out? Uh, well, I don't think I've got all that message. Uh, let me see. Uh, you know, birds get on a schedule. And when, uh, it's funny because my wife works from home more than, and she's here and she gets to see the feeders a lot more uh, than I do. Uh, uh, Saturday morning, I mean, Sunday morning is the only morning I really get to watch the bird feeders in, in, for any length. And, and she's kind of got the schedule for them. You know, she's usually the Orioles show up between eight and nine or, and our Cooper's Hawk tends to come by somewhere between nine and 10. And, you know, the bird, you know, usually you're on a route. Uh, a feeding route for birds as they they move around uh, their, their to, to dependable feeding stations, and so you kind of learn your birds' pattern once they come in. Uh, like mealworms, I always talk about putting out your live mealworms for your bluebirds. Well, if you put those live mealworms at eight a.m. every day, the bluebirds will be perched up, sitting in your bushes at five minutes to eight. They will they know that time you're putting out those mealworms. They get on a schedule too and they come down. And if you're not there, they're still out there waiting for you and they, they want their, their food. So yeah, the, the birds do get on a pattern that way. And you just have to kind of watch what you do with that. I have two cardinal families in my feeders. They aren't territory. Ooh. Yeah, that's uh, Jan, that is unusual right now. I mean, they get to the point where uh, those males tend not to allow another male anywhere close by. It may be that, as, that you know, that they, you know, they're maybe the food situation right now, they're still feeding, you know, like the bird, the, the cardinals feed together in winter with no problem. But once territory start to really be established, like now, uh, they tend to be intolerant of those others that come in now, they, especially at the same time, they may have a little, little bit of an, an agreement of, you know, go get you some food and I'll come and get some food. But uh, that tends to be reduced way down into like one pair during the, the, the heart of the nesting season. So it's interesting that they, they maybe, you know, your yard might be right at the edge of both of them's territory. So you might have a cardinal family that's to the east and a cardinal family to the west. And that, right there, the feeders there in the middle are kind of on the fringe of both of their territories might be the situation as well. Colt says, the mama be with friend when I have... Scolds me when I near the box. Yep, it does sound like a frog. Yeah, we call the uh, the Carolina Wren's uh, scold call is that thumb over a comb sound. That brrrp, brrrp, brrrp. That those Carolina Wrens will sit there and do that. I bet the the call of the, uh, that scold call for a Bewix is pretty close to that too. Speaking of mimic flushes, I heard a brown thrasher singing, and guess what? That is the next bird on my list. Is the brown thrasher. Yeah, you know, they 
That is amazing. You're right. That is an amazing song. Now you talk the the mockingbird is the master mimic. I mean that bird is so incredible. It you know it can know uh, a dozen songs and uh, they can imitate uh, doorbells and telephones ringing and uh, they they they're just master mimics. The brown thrasher is a very good mimic too. It, and uh, as we say uh, jokingly, they're doubly repetitive. The, the they repeat everything. So when it's you know da 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 meeny meeny ba 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 da 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 meeny they they double their, uh, their their repertoire. So every time he, he does a Carolina Rand call, he'll do it twice, and then he may do a Cardinal call and do it twice. And it, that and that's how you can pick that uh, brown thrasher out uh, when you're out bird watching is say because he's repeating himself on, on his songs. And and like I say, they're very good mimics and they're. Uh, they're members of that uh, mimic thrush family with the gray cat birds and the mockingbirds, and they do love jelly. And if you've got brown thrashers and you put out jelly, you're going to get brown thrashers on your jelly. They will find it, and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're beautiful birds. They're, they're and uh, it's the state bird of Georgia, right? And and they uh, they're very common throughout the South. Again, there are other thrashers out west. Uh, there's curb bill thrashers. There's long bill thrashers down in Texas. There's, so we've got uh, different thrashers around the country, but across the most of the eastern two thirds of the country, uh, the, the brown thrashers are, are definitely the most common. Ruth, I didn't realize there were so many birds that would eat jelly. That's right, and that and that's what uh, it used to be. We thought only the Orioles ate the jelly, but the longer we've been putting out the jelly now. These birds come in, and these and and, and one that I uh, is the, the most probably the most common that starts eating early and will eat it even after the Orioles are gone. And other birds are, are the house finches. The house finches love grape jelly, and they they only eat, of course they eat safflower, they eat a lot of things, but they love grape jelly. And right now that's about all I have eaten my jelly until my Orioles show up uh, and they come in. And uh, you know we, we mentioned the mockingbird a minute ago. But I have people who have, you know, cardinals that will taste on the jelly, eat on a little bit. My hummingbirds, ruby-throated hummingbirds, come up and lick the jelly off the top of the Oriole feeder. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, some people have had a Tennessee warbler uh, eating a little bit of jelly uh, at their feeders. So they're, they're, uh, the longer we put the jelly out and offer the jelly up, more birds, I think, will discover it. And it is quick. Like I said, it's a quick sugar energy thing, um, and they're not – we joke about it being the crack cocaine of the bird world, uh, the Oriole world, but no, it's not, you know, it's not harmful. Uh, it, it, we would like, again, clarify, we'd, we'd rather you, you use natural sugars uh, and not high fructose corn syrup, but the, uh, it, it really isn't enough of their diet to, uh, to be harmful to them. Remember, wild birds only get about 15% of their daily diet from bird feeders. They are eating insects. They are eating uh, flower uh, petals. They're eating all kinds, every seed, any seed they can find. They're out there, and, and, and your feeders are just one part of their daily routine eating it. And, you know, and, and as you as you watch your, or, your, your Oriole feeders, you'll see these Orioles coming and going. And you get the watching your Orioles, and you, you can tell the difference between individuals by the amount of black in their head, or they'll have certain areas, you know, that may be orange over here. The other one didn't have. You realize how many different Orioles you do having have coming all day during the, the that spring season. So, the mockingbirds live in our bush pine restaurant. Yes, they do love restaurants. They do destroy any and every bird. <laughs> yes, mockingbirds are very territorial, and they really defend their territories vigorously and they really are all bark and no bite uh, but they have quite a bark they are very showy and you know they they, they intimidate when they're flapping their wings and fluttering and they, they, they act very fierce uh, but they really aren't predators and they're not they're, they, they, but uh, they are intimidating to a lot of birds yep 15 percent of the diet that is every scientific study that's ever been done and there have been a lot of them uh, right, it, you think, oh my gosh, these birds are eating me out of house and home, and and again, it's easy to think. Well, I've only got you know four goldfinches. Well, really, you have forty goldfinches that are they're visiting you all day long, and they're they're coming and going, and some are there when the other ones are out feeding in the pastures and things like that. And so, you know, there there's constant overchange of the birds at your feeder, and you know, we've done there's a lot of studies now where they they're actually able to put. Um, 
bands on the legs that trigger uh, electronic receivers at bird feeders. And so they, they can map these uh, feeder birds as they go around. And we've learned a lot more about how large bird feeding ranges are when it comes to bird feeders. And you know, it, it, it's not that that bird goes out and sits in your bush all day long and only comes to eat from your bird feeder. That's it. That just doesn't happen. They're out there feeding on everything. You know, they eat like a bird saying just means you eat all day. You know, you just eat, you have to eat because you have such high metabolism and you got to gather food up from everywhere you can. Yeah. Yeah. Now, talking about mockingbirds being mean little guys, I'm telling you, uh, I don't think there's anything meaner than a house wren personally, but they are, they are pretty ferocious. All right. So does anybody have any bird, any other birds that you've seen on your jelly uh, that um, hasn't been mentioned here tonight? I know one, I, I don't think I've mentioned red-bellied woodpecker. One, one spring I had a red-bellied woodpecker who would come to the jelly a lot. They'd come up there and, and dart her tongue down there, lick it on it and fly off. And so, you know, they, there's, that's another one that uh, I don't have a picture of, but they, they'll visit and eat the jelly as well. And we know downy woodpeckers really love the sugar water. Uh, people send me pictures all the time of a little downy woodpecker clinging to their hummingbird feeder saying, for the jokingly say, what kind of hummingbird is this? But yeah, they, they, they certain birds do have a affinity for that sugar water. So Bruce said they had brown thrashers nesting in their bushes here. Yeah, and apartment complex. Absolutely. Yeah, they they brown thrash, thrashers are a little more common, but again, they're a bird that likes undergrowth and they love thorny bushes i mean they they, they are amazing they they love you know sticky rose bushes and and they love to get in and nest inside of those so uh and they are on the ground a lot and they're brown and they blend in very well so a lot of people that don't know what a brown thrasher is or they're not familiar with them and so uh they, and of course they migrate they're just getting back in and a root and uh, the store said, you know, her brown thrasher started singing in her yard like yesterday or the day before. So they're just now coming back in. They don't go very far south, but they they are moving back in. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, the, the spring is a great time to see them when there's less leaves on the trees and bushes. So you can see them scratching around in the undergrowth and, of course, coming to uh, eating uh, at your jelly and stuff. Uh, they Every once in a while, we'll have a brown thrasher over winter here. Um, usually... Uh, it, it, it historically, it's been a bird that's probably not well enough to migrate. Uh, and I know we caught one in a banding net one year in the winter, and it had lots of feather lice. It was very unhealthy, and that's probably why that bird never made the journey south where it should have. So, uh, But most of the Merrill Thatchers do migrate for the most part and show back up in the spring. Mentioned Tennessee Warbler, yep. Yeah. I had yellow rumps. Yep, yep. And jelly there. Yeah, thank you, Chandler. That is one that I would suspect, expect to see at a jelly at some point. Uh, the yellow rump warblers are in the eastern part of the world. We call them myrtle warblers. Out west, you guys are, have Audubon's warblers, uh, and uh, they do stick around uh, greatly into winter, and they're here earliest in the spring. And so they're here uh, whenever people start feeding jelly. And, and you know, I, I expect the yellow rumps to show up and, and nibble on some jelly now and again. Cole said, my mom says she's been around backyard bird center when she was on a work trip. Oh, really? I'd have to join her and come see y'all sometime. I'd love to meet you, Colt. Absolutely. We had a, a young man on, that was in on his spring break. His dad brought him to Kansas City, and, and he's from over in Illinois. And they came in, and they, they had been watching, and they wanted to uh, to come on. And he actually went on one of the bird hike, my Thursday morning bird hike with us. He really had a good time. So I love it whenever you get young people enthusiastic about birds. It's it's hard to it, – not a lot of – of your peers out there, you know, that, that think birds are cool, and but they really are, and really encourage you to pursue the hobby. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you have a wild birds unlimited. I can't speak ill of, but they are a national chain, and yes, that it, it, so they are widespread, and you have them everywhere. So, yeah. David from Rhode Hey, David, there. I don't see many of these jelly birds you're talking about, but. I do have a jelly feeder. Would you suggest getting some jelly to see if anyone visits? I would, and I know you're going to be a little bit later up there, uh, but I would get some jelly out here probably in the next week or more. 
week or so and just see what you can get. What you can see. I know you should have house finches visiting there, uh, but uh, just depending upon what kind of habitat you've got around you, uh, you know, forest or, you know, thick underbrush and, and, and you know, I, I would assume you would get at least some of that. I know scarlet tanagers up there. I'm, southern, summer tanagers are more southern, uh, but they, you, I would just hopefully you could get multiple orioles. I, I really would think that. But, uh, you know, I, I would put it out and see what comes, David. I really would. Ruth, the, muse, the bushes, the brown creepers nest then has thick foliage. Yep. I would have known they were there, except you would see them flying in. Yeah, they are very secretive. They, they, those brown thrashers tend to be, you know, and, and they a lot of times they'll fly and sneak in to the, the actual bush they're nesting in. Yep, cold, I know, at 13. They, like I said, I, they, the Internet should be able to provide you a way to connect with people your age that are into birds because there are a lot around the country. There are quite a few young birders out there. Uh, I know that here in Kansas City, uh, they started a young birders club uh, with the local Audubon chapter, and they, they uh, partnered with uh, the, uh, the other chapters around Missouri, and we did some uh, field trips for them, and that, that was pre-COVID, and of course, COVID put a big halt on a lot of that, uh, but now hopefully we get them going again, but you know, trying to get you know young people together that have that interest in birds, we, we want to cultivate that for sure. You guys are the future. I mean, you guys are, you know, I, I remember I uh, went to a bird club meeting in North Carolina years ago, and I was young, out of college, and, and, uh, and uh, we went to this bird club meeting, read about it in the paper, and we walked into the room, and nobody in the room was, everybody in the room was at least twice my age, and I was the youngest by far. And everybody was so excited. There was a young, somebody younger than them coming to the bird club meeting. So, you know, you, you, we've got to cultivate this. It, you know, we've got to have young people bring in new energy into the into this profession uh, and this hobby. You know, it's it's important. David said his grandson is thirteen and an avid birder. See, they're cold. Yep, they. I'm telling you, there are there kids out there. It's just unfortunately distance. Uh, the, 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 the positive thing is the internet's bringing cl kids closer together and there are some great birding camps. There's one out in Colorado every year. Uh, the American Birding Association puts that on and there's one in uh, uh, Delaware every year that they, they and, and these kids come from all over the U.S. and uh, spend a week at this camp and, and, and then they make a lot of connections and they stay in contact over the internet and, and, and compare what they're seeing and things. So there are means to, to, to communicate with people your age, for sure. Thank you, Ruth. I appreciate that. Yeah, it is, she's right. It is a great, it is. I'm very fortunate that, uh, you know, I, I didn't get hooked on birds until college. And when I did, uh, I, I did it just in time. I just, uh, to be able to alter my uh, my wildlife major to take ornithology at the end and only pursue uh, bird jobs. And so, but, it, it, you know, up until that point, I liked birds and I liked snakes and I liked fish, I, you know, the wildlife as a whole, but my interest really didn't click in until college. You know, when I, and, that, and so I've done nothing but birds since then. So, uh, you know, you, you, got, you got an earlier start than I did. And that's a wonderful thing. All right. Gene, does the location of jelly make a difference? Yeah. Should it be further from the, you know, that is, is it further from the house? We used to think that, uh, and it may it, it, at some point it may have been uh, that the, the Orioles were a little shyer uh, because they're not typical bird feeder birds. Uh, but it, and so we used to suggest put your jelly feeder, especially if you've never fed jelly before, you might hang it a little bit further away from the rest of your your other feeders. But anymore, I, I mean, we've got generation after generation after generation of Orioles now that have, or have eaten on jelly feeders and they visit jelly, they know to look for them. And so I don't think it's, it, it is as important as it used to be, but you, if it makes you feel better and you, you've got a place to hang out, remember when it comes to jelly, raccoons absolutely love jelly. They are sweet tooth animals. So if you hang the, your, your Oreo feeders off of a deck arm or uh, somewhere on a little pole out there that, you, that ha doesn't have a baffle on it, the, the raccoons are going to find it and they are going to get, and you're going to wake up in the morning and your jelly feeders can be on the ground. I, I, I woke up one time years ago 
and I looked out my shepherd hook and there was the jelly, the oral feeder was gone. And I looked and it was in my bird bath. The oral had, the, the raccoon had taken over to wash it in the bird bath. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the things they do and he had chewed on it. Uh, he got, I guess they got all the grape jelly taste off of it. So have a plan if you're going to hang it somewhere that the raccoons can get to, like on a deck arm, uh, people who actually take their jelly, uh, oral feeders and hummingbird feeders at night off their deck, put the, they raise their gas grill, put their oral feeders in there, close it next morning, open it up, put the, hang the oral feeder back out uh, because oral, uh, you know, Raccoons will find grape jelly and they will find sugar water. I like to hang them from under the eave. Again, it's a great place in front of a big window that that keeps the raccoons out as well. So, yeah, I, I, so, you know, the same thing about the, I've had uh, Orioles come up and land on a window tray that had or uh, that had grape jelly in it. And a friend of mine years ago tells the story of a she that her, she usually feeds her jelly and a, a, a window feeder in her kitchen, and she. It was in the spring, and she heard uh, this tapping on the window, their kitchen window. She turned, and it was a Baltimore Oriole sitting on that window tray, and she hadn't put the jelly out, and the Oriole was tapping on the window at her. And she, so she went to the great refrigerator, got her jelly, put it, uh, opened it up, he and put it out. He came right back down, and started eating the jelly. So they, they're they're pretty amazing. And hummingbirds, you know, will fly up to uh, sit and hang in front of the window where your hummingbird feeder usually hangs. If you haven't got it out yet, uh, birds know. Birds remember you, so you know that bird fed at, at least some point at that that grape jelly uh, platform in the in the past and it's not been afraid to come up right to the window there so robins yeah colt's asking if robins eat jelly i've had people have uh the the robins eat jelly uh again any of those classic fruit ears uh, i've never seen a bluebird on it and bluebirds eat a lot of fruit uh but uh, i've had people say that they're robins eat. i've never had robins on, on my jelly but Again, you know, robins have switched so much to uh, the worms and things in the spring uh, that uh, they're, you know, I guess if there was a situation where it got really cold and the worms were deeper and there weren't many insects around, they may be forced into jelly and they might eat more then. But if there's plenty of the, their favorite worms available, I doubt they'll eat much jelly for sure. So, all right, so we've added a few birds to the list. Um, and, and, and like I said, it, to, Tennessee warblers one that you know and I don't I wouldn't I, yellow rump um, I I wouldn't be surprised if a orange crown warbler may uh, visit a, a eat jelly as well so there are others and, and, and keep your eyes open it's worth putting it out uh, and the question was asked about other jellies um, again I if doing this for forty years I I tell you everybody who I've ever talked to you know, ends up going back to grape jelly because that just seems to be the trick and, and uh, they're the big attraction. Uh, and don't forget to switch out uh, to uh, mealworms, dry mealworms and, or live mealworms, and you may get to keep those Orioles nesting close by because they have to feed insects to their young. Remember, that's the source of calcium for that growing bones and those baby birds. And so they, they, they need insects. So putting out a source of mealworms for them uh, can be important, and a lot of them will switch. I know uh, Ruth used to uh, put mealworms on top of her grape jelly, and she said whenever she did that, it seemed that the cat birds were the ones that would take advantage of the mealworm fair. They would pick all the mealworms off of there um, and say it, it, when she put them on there, that, that was a favorite of theirs. But you know, a lot of people, they get Orioles to eat mealworms. Absolutely. All right. Any other topics, you guys? Like I said, these are the the, the main birds I wanted to to discuss tonight. Uh, they the uh, I checked the the migration map uh, today, and there are some more. They're kind of scattered oral sightings uh, loosely all over the uh, the country, but not uh, in any big cluster like hummingbirds are. Hummingbird sightings are solid uh, from the south all the way up. Uh, into Missouri, and then scatter, they start to scatter out from there further north. But so there have been a lot more uh, hummingbird sightings, uh, but the Orioles are on the way. And like I said, I've heard catbirds, I've heard uh, uh, brown thrashers here in the last few days. So things are they, things are on the move, and that's why I want to do this program now, so you're ready to, to to hopefully make an ID if you see one of these birds show up your at your jelly feeder that you maybe haven't seen before. Worth keeping an eye out. Now, Cole's asking about how far the way to put his mealworms away from his box. Well, I am not a big fan 
Uh, I've had I've seen people actually put a mealworm dish on top of a bluebird house. I am not in favor of that at all. Uh, and some the, the other birds like chickadees and other want those mealworms too. And so they'll come in and it'll drive that male bluebird crazy. So I usually put my mealworm feeder and my live mealworms in it when they have babies. Oh, it's probably 15 to 20 feet away. I use a little uh, uh, hummingbird pole. I just uh, foot sink it in the ground and hang those mealworms uh, there because it's not like bird seed that, that, that are going to be there for the raccoons to climb or the squirrels to climb. Uh, believe me, I put in 30, 25, 30, 40 mealworms in there in the morning. They're gone in an hour or less than an hour because the bluebirds will gobble them up and the, the chickadees will come in and things as well. So, But I like to have them about 20, 30 feet away. I don't like it too close to my box. I, I just don't want to drive that male crazy. You know, he's wanting to chase other birds away from that nest box. And by putting those mealworms too close, you'll get all those other birds coming in there. Robins, we want being one of them too. Absolutely. Well, the bluebirds, I, I know in our area that we've uh, that we've got hatchlings now. Uh, that, that many people sending me pictures in the last few days of three out of the five eggs hatched, four out of the five eggs hatched. So uh, things are progressing. Spring is happening. We're supposed to get down into the, the thirty or two thirty, into thirties and two thirty here in the next couple of mornings. So uh, it'll be you know it's tougher for them. But believe me, these. Uh, uh, birds, uh, females will brood those young. They'll, they'll incubate those eggs in these cold nights. They'll be fine as long as she's finding food. And, and the temperatures are warming nicely during the day. So there's still insects. And uh, so the, the adults are being able to hunt and find insects as well. And they, they're warm blooded and they'll keep those, those, those eggs warm there. So it is happening. The spring is, has sprung. All right. Well, if you guys don't have any more questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off, and you know we'll be on in a uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I you guys like I say, I always send in ideas for programs. Uh, if you would uh, again, give us a like, give us a share, let other people know about us because we don't want to be a good seeker. We want people to know about us, and, and uh, hopefully they'll they'll get into birds and birding like uh, like you guys are. It's a wonderful happy. I can't I cannot recommend it enough. It's and of course it's been a great profession for me. So thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Uh, it's always fun. You guys always ask great questions and we will see you guys in a couple of weeks.